Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Mark. I studied medieval literature and the history of the English language. Now I teach English and make videos. Hi, I'm Avon. I teach classics, mostly Latin and Latin poetry, and I also make videos. So welcome to our podcast. This is the very first episode, and we're just trying to figure out exactly what we want to do. The basic point of this podcast is to expand on a series of videos that we've been making together for a while. The video series really is yours, Mark, that it came out of work you'd been doing, so maybe you should introduce it. Yeah, so I've been making videos about language and history and culture and cognition and the ways that all of these things kind of interact, often in surprising or unexpected ways. I suppose the fundamental idea behind them is that things do sort of connect in a number of different ways that cross what are traditionally divided up as disciplinary boundaries. As areas of study as in a university, or things that even things that people say, oh, I'm interested in science, or even if they're not uh, things that are taught, people mm -hmm. kind of divide them up as being separate fields of interest and fields of study. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that, I, you know, I think a lot of people who specifically work on language, particularly in the area of lexicography of making dictionaries are quite aware of. If you're going to make a dictionary, you're going to have to at some point deal with scientific terms, which yeah. means you have to understand a little bit about the science behind them, or you have to understand economic terms. Well, in a dictionary, when people are making a dictionary, basically you have experts on a whole bunch of different fields, but nobody can, they can't afford to have somebody who's an expert only on one particular field because that just doesn't make sense. So everybody knows that you're going to have to have competencies across a pretty big range mm -hmm. to be able to do the kind of job that you're going to do. Yeah. And you have to be prepared to go and, and look for that. And find experts and when you need to consult yeah. with them. Find know. experts when you need to consult with them and, you know, play around in someone else's backyard from, from time to time to, to, to figure out how things work. Mm -hmm. So you started making these videos and they've been going on for about a year. We've been doing them and I've been helping with them and working on them as well doing script editing and uh, helping with the uh, audio and promotion and a bunch of other stuff, appearing in a few. And then we decided that we might want to take that information that you're doing and take it further beyond the videos, build on what you've been working up for the videos, but also explore some other less formal or less sort of finished product stuff. And that's what a podcast is for, because we all know that podcasts are completely and totally informal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, the thing is, there, there's always so much that can't go into the videos, which are very, often very carefully crafted and edited and tightly encapsulated. And structured, yeah. And structured. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really fit in there. And a lot of the, the really kind of interesting aspects about that tend to come out when I'm just sort of telling someone about them. Mm -hmm. Basically, you tell me every day when I come home and you tell me what you've been doing, you explain all sorts of interesting connections that often don't make it into the scripts because they just are too slightly too loosely connected or a bit tangential or just um, we need to cut for time because they're already too long. Mm -hmm. So we thought, hey, why not record those conversations, <laughs> essentially? And that's pretty much what the podcast is going to be. So what we thought we'd do is take a couple of different approaches to exploring these other ideas. So there's three sorts of episodes that will probably end up happening, though goodness knows things may change. One will be what we're going to do today, which is do a little bit of discussion and set up the voiceover from one of the videos and play that for you so that you can hear it. Because while these were designed to go with visuals, they do function as a an audio track as well and they get most of the information across so we'll set that up and then we'll play it and then we'll talk a little bit about it and add a little bit of information about it so that'll be one kind of episode we're also probably going to have a few episodes that are just us talking about some things we've noticed maybe you about your research the stuff that you've found that hasn't made it into a video or that might in the future but it's just some odd interesting connection right mm-hmm 
and then also we will have some guests and we'll be looking around for all sorts of different people who are just interesting. How would you describe the kind of guests we're looking for? Well, basically, I think the uh, we want to cast the net pretty widely and sometimes talk to academics, sometimes academics in fields that we're maybe more familiar with, but also academics in fields that are very different from what we normally do. But also, we'd like to talk to people who whose approach to, to this kind of interconnectivity is born out in other ways outside of the academy. So that it's not just about what you study and how you teach it, though that's something we're both always interested in and we'll want to talk to people about, but things about life, how in your life, in your job, in your daily life, things connect in odd ways. And that's what we're going to be asking people about. Uh, we'll find some people who have just interesting lives or interesting things to talk about or are particularly passionate about particular subjects and ask them to tell us about interesting connections they happen to have found, ways that things that they didn't think would have any connection to each other have and have been important to them, and explore that idea. And how and how those kinds of interconnections enrich what you're doing mm -hmm. um, in, in ways that are not simply, you know, one plus one equals two, but that that connection, the, the nature of that connection leads to something more than just the two parts individually. And especially if that couldn't be predicted from the outside. Mm -hmm. So look for some of those coming out in the next little while. We'll be putting out uh, episodes on a fairly regular basis. We hope maybe every couple of weeks. We'll have to see as we get started exactly what the schedule is going to be, but I think we're going to aim for every two weeks to start off with. But today we're going to, as I said, focus on one video. This is the one that we started the video series with because, and it's labeled, introduction. Yeah. <laughs> so some of your videos came out of lectures that you did with classes and some of them have come out, of, uh, we'll talk later about a whole series of, that are based on word etymologies, but where did this video come from? Yeah, this one wasn't actually the first one that I wrote or, or uh, put together. Uh, this was kind of, in a sense, backformed after I'd already done a few other videos because I realized I needed an introduction. This was done in a much more conscious way, I think in a lot of ways one of the, the first that I did specifically for producing as a video. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the first two that I did were did come out of the classroom, things that I was doing in the classroom, and then I sort of modified them and did them as as blogs and then re-edited them into into the videos. But this one was written specifically to to function as as a introduction to the video series. Specifically, it was backformed, I guess, from the second episode, which demonstrated this idea of interconnection. So a lot of what, um, you know, this one is going to focus on is the idea of interconnectivity and the importance of interdisciplinarity, the importance of crossing those, those divides of different subjects and, and finding the ways that they intersect and how that's important to really understand things fully. Right. So we're going to uh, pause now and play that audio and you can listen to it. And then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about any points that we wanted to really raise or expand on or just stress. And then we'll be done with this episode and we'll tell you what's going to be coming up next. Enjoy. The world is a complicated place. We've all heard the pop culture references to Six Degrees of Separation and the Kevin Bacon game, or the butterfly effect in which chaos theory tells us a butterfly beating its wings can cause a hurricane on the other side of the planet. One way of thinking about these types of things is interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is a property of complex systems, which is a concern not just of scientists and mathematicians, but of social sciences such as economics, sociology, and anthropology, and I think that such an approach is useful for the study of history and culture too. A complex system is any system composed of many interconnected parts in which understanding each individual part doesn't mean you understand the whole system. In colloquial terms, it's more than the sum of its parts. This is a phenomenon called emergence. An obvious example is weather and climate. Perhaps the most notable example of emergence is the mind, which is seen as arising from the complex system of interconnected neurons in the brain. 
This approach to understanding cognition is known as connectionism. According to this model, human cognition, thought, is the result of the interaction of a hundred billion neurons, each of which has several thousand synapses, for a total of several hundred trillion synaptic connections. The overall map of these connections is often referred to as the connectome, perhaps most famously by neuroscientist Sebastian Sung, who advanced the proposition I am my connectome in his notable TED talk. The idea is that, similar to the way your genome makes you physically who you are, your connectome makes you mentally who you are. According to this hypothesis, the pattern of these connections encodes all your thoughts, memories, and personality. It is because of the vast number of connections in the brain that something as complex as cognition can happen. In addition to general cognition, our brains specifically have the cognitive faculty of language. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, interconnectivity is important in language as well, and some of the cognitive approaches to language are based on this. For instance, in frame semantics, the meanings of words or concepts is structured not like a dictionary, but like an encyclopedia. That is to say, you can't understand a word without also knowing a large variety of related concepts. Thus, to understand the word sell, you have to know a number of related concepts in the domain of financial transactions, such as buyer, money, and so forth. Thus, a word brings up a semantic frame of related knowledge, and it's by this frame that we understand the word. Sometimes a word can belong in more than one frame, and thus have different meanings depending on context. Bank in the context of a river has a very different meaning than bank in the context of money, and you have to have a broad conceptual and cultural understanding to be able to correctly interpret such expressions as a strong man, a strong woman, a strong smell, a strong argument, and so on. Thus, it's the interaction of words that creates meaning. We can picture this as a kind of web of words that collectively produce a meaning not entirely clear from the meaning of the individual words themselves. The world too is highly interconnected, as the six degrees of separation idea makes clear. You might also be aware of the history of science TV series Connections by James Burke. Burke showed the often surprising lines of influence that drove scientific innovations. This was a direct challenge to the more linear view of history, and in particular the history of science and technology. Instead of progressing in small incremental steps, Burke sees innovation often taking surprising leaps from one seemingly unconnected area to another. So it's interesting to note then that the complex connections inside our heads mirror the complex connections in the world around us. In a sense then, I'd like to explore interconnectivity on two levels, the micro level of cognition and language, and the macro level of culture and history, and further look at how these systems interact, since language, culture, and thought are constantly influencing each other. And it is no surprise, given the interconnected nature of our brains, that we are superb pattern recognition machines, and seem to be driven to seek out patterns in the complex world around us. And given that these historical and cultural connections can often take quite unexpected turns, we have to cast our net quite widely when we're seeking to understand the world. One consequence of this is the need for interdisciplinarity. For those not familiar with the world of academia, universities are generally rigidly divided into a variety of disciplines. At the larger level, there are main groupings such as sciences and humanities, which are further divided into departments such as physics, chemistry, biology, literature, history, and philosophy. There are certainly good organizational reasons for this kind of division, as it allows in-depth interaction within disciplines with others working on similar areas, and puts researchers and students with others of a like mind who might best be able to appreciate their shared material. I suppose ultimately this kind of division goes back to the medieval arrangement of education into what is known as the trivium and quadrivium. The first level, the trivium, with three subjects, is what we might now think of as the arts, grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, that is, logic. The second level, the quadrivium, with four subjects, consisted of what we might call the sciences, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, that is, the theoretical study of harmonics. The word trivium means literally three ways, referring obviously to the three parts, from Latin tri, three, and via, way, or road, and on a more literal level the same word was used to refer to a crossroad of three streets. From this also comes the modern English word trivial. Now I'm not suggesting that intense specialization is trivial, but the research produced from increasingly specialized disciplines runs the risk of being appreciated by only a small few who are in the know. Now this kind of detailed work is very important for advancing and solidifying what we know about the world. Quantum physicists may discover the fundamental operations of reality, or paleographers may determine where a particular medieval manuscript comes from. But sometimes great advances come from the unexpected intersection of different knowledge sets, and because few people can be experts in more than one field, these kinds of perspectives can be missed. Hence the need for interdisciplinarity, which seeks to make connections across the traditional boundaries. That's the background behind this approach to understanding the world around us and why interconnectivity matters. On a more individual level, interconnectivity is one way our minds organize information, in other words, associative memory, like the memory palace technique which has received much attention recently, most notably in the recent TV adaptation of the Sherlock Holmes stories. 
There are other techniques we use too, though, other ways of knowing, such as narrative and metaphor. We tend to think of narrative and metaphor as simply literary techniques, but in fact they are much more fundamental than that. It turns out that narrative and metaphor are basic tools the mind uses to organize and understand information, but more on that another time. What we're going to do here is start with an approach in part founded on those elements of cognitive science and cognitive linguistics I mentioned before, and use language, literature, and history to explore this web of connections. Many of the videos you'll see on this channel will start with a word as a jumping off point, with its etymology, that is the words history and origin, giving us a way to explore history and culture more widely, and then after that anything's fair game. For the first little while you'll also see videos which further explore these ways of knowing I mentioned, interconnectivity, narrative, and metaphor. And to highlight the connective nature of these ideas, I'll use what are called concept maps to visualize them, showing the interconnections between different elements. After all, here we are on the internet and the world wide web, a vast interconnected world in which we can all dig deep down into our own specialties, but also share with others in a way unprecedented in previous human history. What better place to explore these connections, both old and new? So. That was where it all started. That's the basis for a the lot trigger. of the, right. That's the, tr the word. The trigger for so much of the rest of what we've done in the videos, and if you haven't seen those yet, uh, you'll be hearing about them for the next while. I think a few things that kind of leapt out at me. I know because I know you that the reference to James Burke is not just a passing mention, but something that is really at the bottom of a lot of this. Because he's someone who's always been your hero, right? Yeah, I've been an admirer of his work for quite a long time. I remember uh, watching his TV series uh, Connections and The Day the Universe Changed way back, I think, when I was a teenager, probably, and being deeply influenced by them and, and, and sort of seeing, yeah, that's kind of how I see the world. Right, and so it was yeah. neat to have that, that sort of almost kind of validation or whatever. And I've sort of carried that with me for a long time. And it's come out in a number of different ways. Yeah. And for both of us, that is not just something we're both interested in in daily life, but it's really carried over into our fields of study mm -hmm. because we both work in inherently interdisciplinary fields. So I do classics and classics is really a time period, not a discipline. We have certain things that are important to our disciplines, but if you do classics, you, as a matter of course, are trained in history and literature and certain elements of technical things like languages and grammar and manuscript history and archaeological yeah. information, even if those aren't the things you specialize in. So art for me, too, art history, yeah, absolute mythology, mm -hmm. and even a certain amount of uh, the history of science because that and history of philosophy mm. uh, those are important so even though my main field is Latin poetry and I'm certainly no expert in coins or archaeological digs I have to know a certain amount about that not only for my research where it is important but also for teaching I teach all sorts of stuff I teach all sorts of stuff I pff, frankly knew very little about before I started teaching it so that's just the way that classicists think we're sort of interested in anything that happens in a certain period around the Mediterranean. And the same is kind of true for you. Yeah, I think medieval studies in a lot of ways is the sort of sweet spot for that interdisciplinary approach because it, it, it's th there's a lot of stuff that remains. Right? We've got the music yeah, from that period. Yeah, so where um, classics has, has some gaps. lost a bunch of stuff so we yeah. can only focus on certain elements of it, you've got a lot more sources. But it's not so... It, it's not too recent to the point where there's just too much either uh, in terms of scope of coverage or geographically because in the Middle Ages we're still talking about well either Europe or you, it has been also extended to Asia and other other medieval. Yeah. So when we talk about medieval studies it's a very Eurocentric it medi be, medieval studies. Because though some people do do kind of take it in a, in a broader sense. And that but again work. it's a period in geography rather than a discipline. Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about medieval studies as a field. Yeah. yeah. So that approach is really important, and James Burke was really important to you, uh, and that really shows when you watch the videos, and especially in your interest in overlapping science and humanities, in particular, in seeing how it goes back and forth between culture and science. Not that every video or everything you've done is, is on that topic specifically, but 
it's clearly really important. The other thing is really just about language. We should probably say a, a word or two about the fact that, well, well, you do talk about language in that in the introduction there, but what doesn't maybe come out is exactly how language heavy <laughs> your interests are. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's going to become evident in later episodes, uh, which focus often very specifically on etymology, the history of words, where they come from and how they change over time. I mean, you're right. Yeah, there, there is, it is, I do kind of touch on the way language works. Language frame works semantics like frame and semantics stuff like and that so and linguistic, cognitive linguistics, mm -hmm. yeah. It, but in a lot of ways, I use language as a kind of jumping off point to to look at those broader, because language can go anywhere, anywhere in sort of human activity is going to be covered by language. It's going to be yeah. touched by language. Yeah. So it's it's an, an entry point. And also every kind of human activity affects language. Yes. It's that inter it's that back and forth that's important that you the words change because of things humans do and then the way the words change tells us about things humans do. It goes both ways. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's very important. And as a final note I suppose we can say that you know we have very particular linguistic backgrounds in that because I do classics, my interest and knowledge mainly lies in Latin and Greek. Yours? Primarily, um, yeah, the, the Germanic group of languages, Old English, Old Norse, and Latin. Mm -hmm. And then we both know French. And so while your studies will take you to, you know, when you actually look up etymologies, you go all sorts of different directions. We do have a tendency in just our general trivia knowledge to focus on those areas that we know best. So I hope that you as listeners found that interesting, and we'd love to hear from you if you did, or I suppose even if you didn't, and if there's any suggestions you have. For more information, check out the website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. And our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hi, I'm Mark. I studied medieval literature and the history of the English language. Now I teach English and make videos. Hi, I'm Avon. I teach classics, Latin and Latin poetry, and also make videos. Oh, and we're married. Yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you. I was worried that maybe you didn't agree. <laughs>